We're going to pick the brain of a mental health professional today, Monday, March 30th, 2020. I'm Ben Dryden. You're listening to Dryden Wire Live. Darren Cox is going to be our very special guest today. He's actually the first one of our guests. We have a whole bunch of guests lined up this week, and we're probably going to do uh, these every day, weekdays, um, Monday through Friday, um, probably for the next month or so. Um, tomorrow, uh, looks like we have Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald on. Uh, Wednesday, Sawyer County Judge John Yackel. Thursday is Spooner Area School District Superintendent Dr. David Aslan. Friday, business owner, foster care provider, and 10th Senate District candidate Cherie Link. Um, before Darren comes on here, just on a personal note, I understand that we're all trying to find innovative, innovative ways to um, keep busy. Uh, our brains occupied uh, during this global health pandemic. However, I do think it's important to maintain a certain level of levity. A little humor is a good thing, so we welcome you to share your comments, ask questions, and be engaged. A little bit about Darren. Uh, he is a mental health professional in Spooner and has practiced here since 2004. He's the owner of Anchor Bay Counseling Center, which employs two full-time therapists and serves the mental health needs of individuals, kids, and families. When not in the office, he enjoys time outdoors, time spent with his wife of 22 years, Heather, and times of solitude. Uh, when I asked him last week when we were doing a little pretest uh, for Skype here, um, what he has doing, what he's doing during this health pandemic, he said that he has boycotted television, all things that stoke fear in an effort to maintain his own peace and takes his marching orders from Psalm 46. So let's see if we can get him on here. Darren, Cox, Darren, are you there, buddy? I am. Good morning, Ben. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. Yourself? <laughs> good. I'm glad you didn't say good. <laughs> I learned my lesson last week when you said don't start your interview with good. Yeah. Oh, so. it's the worst when you ask someone a question and, and they just give one word answer. It's you're killing me. Say something. <laughs> yeah, we're fine. We're fine. Nice. So obviously, uh, with social distancing being what it is, uh, would love to have you here in the, in the studio, here in the dungeon here. Um, yep. So how is this, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, the social distancing, how has that impacted your business? Well, um, we're adjusting like everybody else is. You know, we're having to kind of learn things on the fly um, because we're really in a new era in our in our history. Not only as a as a um, a state, but as a country. I mean, it's been what 100 years, I think, since we've had anything even remotely similar to this. Yeah. Uh, our last pandemic, the Spanish flu of 1918, and. I don't know about you, but I was not around then, so oh. I uh, I can't uh, can't compare anything there. So we got little to look to from a from a guidance standpoint, and you know, in a lot of ways, Ben, we're we're figuring things out on uh, on the fly here. Um, you know, each day kind of brings out a series of new new question marks, um, and this fluid nature of everything that we're we're going through. I think in a word for people is unsettling. That's a word I hear over and over and over again. And, you know, some people are panicked um, and people never make good decisions when they're panicked. This is where we're seeing the, you know, hoarding of the toilet paper and, and uh, you know, mass sell off on the stock market as people are making panic based types of decision. Yeah. I'd invest um, in Zoom, by the way. Like everybody's yeah. using Zoom right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Haircuts is going to be another good one to invest in in about yeah. a month. And we <laughs> all look like a bunch of woolly mammoths. Yeah. And actually, you should probably just purchase. If you can, if you can find them, a whole bunch of baby toys, a whole bunch of uh, anything that has to do with babies. Because in nine months mm -hmm. from now, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see the, uh, a whole bunch of babies being born. You bet. Yep. Mini <laughs> baby booth on the way. <laughs> yep. 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 Yeah. So. So speaking of like Zoom and stuff like that, uh, are, are you doing remote? Thing? Do you do remote stuff or in your line of work as a mental health professional? Is it is it? Uh, even with social distancing, it's it just one person that comes in that can sit six feet away, or is that kind of stop now? Well, yeah, I mean, we we fall under the category of essential services, and if we wanted to, we we still could have people come in. But we made the decision really for the next two weeks that we want to focus on uh, on telehealth, and telehealth is like the model like we're using right now of you know video uh, online uh, types of services. And although we could stay open, we wanted to be smart about it. And so we've transitioned really over all of last week and, and this uh, coming week. And depending upon what the 
uh, Department of Health and CDC provides for guidelines, we're going to continue to just offer a, a, a telehealth model. Um, now, I admit I was resistant to telehealth. I'm a little old school when it comes to, you know, the face to face model, uh, wanting to maintain that, you sure. know, person to person contact yeah. and, and, and telehealth is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a bit above my pay grade when it comes to my technological awareness. So I was a bit, you know, resistant to, yeah. to go down that road. But I had been pleasantly surprised with, uh, you know, the process. And once we got it going and and got it implemented, um, you know, with established people, it's it's not been bad. I think it'd be a little different if you'd never met somebody and you can't, you know, kind of gauge first you know, time who visit they are. type, right? Yep. yep, first time visit. I think you're going to be a little more difficult. Yeah. But we've really tried to, uh, you know, maintain some continuity for for our established yeah. people. And yeah, it's like a, it's like going on a, a first date. It's tough to have a a, a first date on Zoom. Uh, it, you kind of need to, you know, sit down across the dinner table and get to know the person mm-hmm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's 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 different, but different isn't necessarily mean bad. It's just uh, you know one of the adjustments that uh, yeah. you know we've we've needed to make. So now, of, of all the things that you're doing right now, uh, well, in this case specifically, remote or telehealth chats, mm-hmm. are there other things? And um, are the things that you're doing right now, including telehealth, are, are these things that because you are being I wouldn't say forced, but because this is the how you have to adapt. Are any of these things, when this is all said and done in a month, in a year, somewhere in, in there probably, uh, that you might just start implementing and keeping as, you know, we're going to start doing this actually more often? Or is this really not apply? Uh, you know, I think it's going to be something that uh, uh, will require us to make make adjustments. And I anticipate that telehealth is, is going to continue. Um, you know, we're rural to begin with under, you know, the best of circumstances, and it enables us to reach people when they're unable to come into the office. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is there's been some adjustments in what insurers, uh, Medicaid, Medicare uh, will pay for. They're actually giving us the latitude right now uh, to stay in touch with people telephonically, not just, you know, telehealth with the video, but also outreach phone calls. Um, and my hope is that they'll loosen up some of those those parameters so that we can, you know, maintain contact without necessarily having a, a face-to-face model. So, yeah, I, I see this continuing. Um, I'm going to continue to offer telehealth regardless of, you know, when the coronavirus gets done, just as a, a an option for people that can't yeah. get here. Um, so we talked just now, of course, about your your business. But what about from the perspective of your uh, is client? Is that the correct terminology? Mm-hmm. Or, all right. Yep. So of your clients, um, is this going okay in terms of the telehealth stuff? Um, are they wanting to come in? Um, how do you think kind of their mental place is in all of this and in, 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 in how you communicate with them? You know, they've been very receptive to telehealth to date. The feedback that I'm getting is that uh, they want to continue to do it, So, um, which has been, you know, good because my goal – really has been try to keep the lights on during this time, yeah. um, try to maintain a semblance of continuity. So the feedback that we're getting, you know, from the people that have engaged in telehealth so far has been, you know, positive. My concern really is for kids because this is a pretty static type of uh, uh, atmosphere, and I don't know how engaging uh, it's going to be for a 12-year-old boy or girl to be talking to yeah. a therapist on the other side. Yeah. You know, so we're a little concerned about that because you can't do, you know, play therapy or those types of things through this type of medium. But, um, yeah, so far, so good. What concerns do you have during this safe at home, stay at home situation? What concerns do you have for people? Well, I mean, <laughs> you uh, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about uh, a good time to invest in anything maternity related because you know I, I do think we're heading for a for a bit of a baby boom. Um, but just saying, you know, so, yeah, so there's some good things I guess that are kind of going to come out of this stay at home order. But you know, one of the things Ben that influences overall happiness in a person's life is the capacity to exercise some direction or influence over where things go. You know, the ability to support themselves, the ability to take care of a standard of living, so to speak. And this stay at home order has greatly impacted our capacity to be able to, you know, exercise control over the direction that our lives go, um, to be able to, you know, uh, make a decent, decent living and, and, and maintain a standard of living. So 
because you know we live in a high poverty area under the under the best of economic circumstances that's just kind of part and parcel of of northwest wisconsin so you know my concerns for this you know shelter at home is that this gets more and more acute as this process plays itself out that the needs become you know more and more dire o- over time um, so from a financial piece i worry about that I worry about our frontline workers, um, law enforcement, uh, folks in uh, uh, the medical profession. You know, we talked about, you know, not being able to get a haircut. You're talking about people that make their living off providing those types of services yeah. that have been, you know, shut down. So um, I'm concerned about, you know, those populations. I'm also very concerned about our, our elderly uh, because of how isolated they are to begin with. And then you add this additional layer of fear and you know, we know that Corona impacts the elderly at a at, at a higher rate. At least that's what the the studies are showing initially. So, so those are my areas of concern as we continue with this with this shelter at home process. So, what do you, um, when you have been talking to uh, our clients, and obviously, obviously, no specifics or people, etc. But um, just maybe an overall um, is the is the mental health that what you're kind of getting back. Uh, that it's a positive thing or maybe not even necessarily your clients, but what you just kind of see, whether it's friends or uh, other family members, um, maybe just on Facebook, there's been a lot of really funny and unique and some wildly inappropriate, which makes them even funnier uh, memes that people have been putting out and what their kids are doing and the moms and dads are doing. Uh, do, do you think that overall our mental health as a society right now with this, everyone stay at home uh, is in a good place? Well, we're having to we're having to adjust, Ben. Um, you know, one of the things that I read was that Corona really impacts a pretty primal level of, of fear in us, and that primal fear is that we're going to end up alone. We're going to end up isolated. And you know, there's a big difference between being lonely and being alone. Okay. And I think what we're seeing is that this Corona is forcing us to have different ways to be able to connect with people, different ways to be able to Um, maintain that social connection. We're having to get creative to do it. So, you know, there's a lot of negative stuff about Corona coming out right now, but some of the things that people are not, you know, hearing as much that I think is important to hear is like, you know, I'll speak for my own, my own school, Shell Lake. uh, And I'm, can promise you other school districts are doing the same thing. I've just got, you know, information there, but you know, they delivered 3,600 meals a week right now, you know, to families. Okay. To me that that's remarkable. Um, that what started out as one person wanting to make some donations towards uh, grocery store gift cards and placing them in with those meals has now turned into where there's been 75 gift cards donated to a local grocery store to make sure that people have access to be able to, to, to continue to buy food. So you're seeing, you know, our community rally around to be able to meet needs in ways that really fly underneath the radar. And again, I know that's taking place, you know, outside of just what I, what I see in Shell Lake, but to me, that's been, that, that's been pretty cool to see. Well, um, it's, uh, uh, with the two or $2.2 trillion, you know, budget stuff. So we're all getting some money, I guess, or a lot of people are, um, the kids, and I was explaining to the kids that, okay, so, you know, Jewish, my wife and I, you know, 1,200, family, 24, and then kids are 500. I'm like, hey, kids, you're getting 500 bucks. So what do you want to do with it? Well, obviously, it's not necessarily for them, but in a weird way, we started talking about it, uh, my wife and I, and decided maybe we should give a little bit of that to them because, one, they can, you know, purchase something a little more for home. Uh, we even play, you know, lots of puzzles. I think we put them mm-hmm. all together at this point. But a uh, out of that $500, they each get um, 150 50 mm-hmm. dollars for themselves and a hundred dollars they have to figure out how they're going to donate that to yeah. whom to where and so we're that's what we're going to kind of be working on this week is to you know give some recommendations or just whatever they're thinking about doing but it's those little things it really is that's what i have noticed even around here there's a lot of obviously the restaurants with the the uh, um, they can do takeout now mm-hmm. uh, or a lot of them can and just about every business owner or just families, neighbors, they're ordering out more than they ever have in the past. Yep. yep. And, you know, they're not making a lot more money. You know, they're not sitting at home making a fortune, uh, but we're investing back into uh, our community. And yep. I think that is one of the huge positives that are coming out of that. Have you seen any outside of like the shell, like what you just noticed? Um, are you seeing a lot more of those things? Are you doing things like that? Well, you know, 
at this point in time, we we haven't. But I, I love your idea with what you're doing with your kids. You know, I think the capacity to be able to give back and other people, you can use this as a time to be able to, you know, teach teach that lesson. Um, you know, generosity, you can be generous uh, from a distance. You don't have to do it in face to face contact. And I think that's, you know, what, what you're getting at. But I'd love to see more focus on that positive end of things rather than just the statistics we get pounded on with the numbers and incidents and, and all the things that just produce produce fear. So, well, we publish a lot of those on Dreadnought. <laughs> well, we, do. I mean, it's, we just do. It's, it's the daily update thing from the from the you know, DHS. And it's well, it's our job. I'm, mm-hmm. Honestly, I'm really, I really wish we could just go back to what we, you know, normally do. But we've even had to adjust. Oh, yeah. and, and now, like mom's her Diane's kitchen, uh, she's getting ready to start doing some of these remote chats as well. Um, obviously, a lot of the court systems down. We did a lot of crime and court uh, uh, stories, and there's just not a whole lot. You look at the booking reports; there's like two people arrested in right. the whole week. There's just nothing's really going on. So it's just coronavirus 24/7, man. And yeah, it is what it is. So what advice? So going uh, uh, going back to um, <clears throat> the babies in maybe nine months uh what advice would you give couples during this time okay well with couples you're kind of stuck on uh in in a small enclosed space and you're going to be picking at each other you're going to be you're going to be sniping at each other what do you mean what you know exactly what i'm talking about (laughs) why why do you think i'm here right now (laughs) and why is it (laughs) home so In a word for couples, I think the number one thing to focus on is grace. And when I talk about grace, what I mean by that is not giving somebody something they deserve or, you know, or or, or, yeah, you bet, (laughs) or not giving something that they do deserve. Giving grace to each other, unmerited favor is is a way of looking at that. So recognizing that when people are afraid, when people are under duress, they're not going to be at their best. You know, they're just not going to be of uh, how they normally would operate. So, you know, extending grace to each other, I think, is is really important because when you're out of sorts, Ben, it gets magnified at home. You know, we've all heard of the kick the dog syndrome back in the day. Um, this is kind of what happens when you're having to shelter in place and, and you're next to each other for that amount of time. Actually, I don't know that one, the kick the dog reference. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, to avoid... Uh, um, any animal rights references, I will drop it at that point in time. So I'll, I'll, I'll Google it. <laughs> okay. All right. That's <laughs> it. Old, old expression from the past. Okay. Um, but anyways, in healthy relationships, there's a balance between independence and interdependence. Okay. So our capacity to be independent right now has been compromised because you're having to shelter a place. You're not able to do the things that you, you, you normally would. Um, so we don't get as we don't get much of a break from each other. And like I said, when we're fried and snipping at each other, to me, this is the time to really focus on self-care. What do you do to offload so that you're not unloading on your partner? You know, your way of offloading is different things for different people. But typically it involves, you know, some form of exercise, um, you know, some form of a hobby that you enjoy doing. You know, it can be reading, crafting, making something, splitting wood. You know, yesterday we went on a walk even in the middle of the rain and snow on the Ice Age Trail, you know, and that's a way to be able to yeah. unload all of that stuff. It's just so just real quick, uh, splitting wood is not a hobby. Well, for some people oh, it, it is. Oh, it can't be a hobby. Uh, it's bet. a chore. That's not a hobby. Uh, wow. <laughs> when you're forced to do it as a kid and we bring up, you know. Oh, I remember uh, doing that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. That's but, why I speak no, so I passionately split. about it. It's not a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I split two cords of wood on Saturday and loved every minute of it. So you're weird. Ah, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> but you know, so recognizing that you're not going to be at your best with with each other as a couple. Uh, number two is keep short accounts. You know, now's not the time to be keeping a laundry list of offenses. You know, let the little stuff go. It's not worth fighting over. It's not worth arguing over. Sometimes I'll give couples uh, the assignment that, you know, if if it's a big enough argument, you'll take the time to write it down and then revisit it. And if you're not willing to write it down, then it's probably not worth arguing over. So we need to learn to let things go. Um, And the last thing that I want to give you is there's nine important words to keep in mind uh, as a couple. Okay. Number one, first set of three is I love you. Second set of three is I am sorry. Third set of three is please forgive me. These are nine of the most important words that you will ever speak to each other as a couple. I love you. I'm sorry. And please forgive me. Keeping short accounts is a great tool to be able to maintain the peace during our time of shelter at home. Well, you just pretty much described my morning conversation with my wife, 
my midday conversation with my wife and my evening conversation with my wife. <laughs> I love you. And then around noon, I'm having to say I'm sorry. And then that evening, please forgive me. <laughs> So makes sense. Does it work? <laughs> yeah, so far, I don't know. Okay. She hasn't caught All on. Right. Like I didn't okay. even know what I apologize. I just do it at you know twelve o'clock. Set an alarm on my phone. I'm sorry. For what? My, I, just whatever. My in-laws do. The I'm exact pretty same sure thing. I did something dumb. So mm -hmm. I'm just gonna apologize for it right now. <laughs> yeah, my in-laws do the same thing. They wake up every morning, no matter what's happened, and they say, "I'm sorry." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what about advice that you would have for um, parents with kids? Well, like a lot of people are homeschooling because it's not summer vacation. You know, right. they should be learning something. So, so what what advice or what tips or what information do you have for them? Sure. Well, when it comes to parenting, more is caught than taught. Okay, and what I mean by that is, what are your children observing? Okay, so. If you are feeding yourself as an adult on a steady, non-stream, 24-7 cycle of news and you are anxious and you are irritated, um, anxious parents have a tendency to influence anxious kids, you know? So number one is, is, is what are you modeling, you know, for your children? Um, and I'm a firm believer that you got to keep your kids informed in, in, in generalities, Ben. But we don't want to go into so much depth that we overwhelm them, okay? So it's trying to find that balance of we're not pulling the covers over our head and waiting for this thing to blow over. But we need to keep our kids informed, you know, so that they're aware, so that they're culturally culturally aware and culturally sensitive to what's going on around without, without overwhelming them. So that's number one is what are you modeling as a parent? You know, the second piece of this is that even though we're not in school right now, you know, we're having to homeschool, as you say, we still need to maintain that same sense of structure and routine. So, you know, if your bedtime during the week as a parent when school is in session is typically, you know, nine o'clock, then I would recommend that you keep the exact same type of bedtime. Um, mornings to me, if you can provide a little more latitude, it's nice to be able to sleep in. And we all know that kids function well on, on ample amounts of sleep, but trying to maintain some, some structure and routine really becomes important. So not only with nighttime, but also during the daytime with set aside time for schoolwork. We're encouraging families to create a homework space within the home, um, putting up a desk, putting up a computer station where the kids got a designated place to be able to go to, to be able to do their, do their work. Um, social media and electronics. Kids aren't allowed to have their phones out during the day when they're at school. To me, this should be replicated at home. You know, you set aside times for them to touch base with their friends, perhaps over the noon hour, catch up on social media, and then it goes away again, just like we would when we're in a normal school day. So you must be try, real popular with your kids at home. <laughs> at times, not so much. <laughs> but you know, I'm I'm more concerned about their character, Ben, than uh, I am yeah. comfort. Oh, I get it. And, yeah, and that's to me, those two things go part and parcel. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maintaining a sense of structure, um, not getting overwhelmed with, with, with media, um, you know, and learning, I think, to appreciate the time spent together. Because you talked about puzzles earlier, that you're running out of puzzles in your home. You know, our home's the same way. Uh, building tree forts, making puzzles, uh, playing, you know, uh, goofy card games, uh, going on hikes, uh, spike ball. You know, we've been having spike ball tournaments in the middle of the house. What's spike ball? Oh, it's a new game the kids are playing. I'll Google that one too then. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of kids are really, really into spike ball. Um, so trying to make memories out of good things right now rather than just so heavily focused on, you know, all corona all the time, you know. Um, because I think from a society standpoint, society hit record here, Ben. And what I mean by that is that we're going to look back in 40 or 50 years and remember how we responded um, as a family as people during this time of Corona. And I want to be, I want to remember the time that we were forced to coalesce the fourth time when we were, you know, when we became better as a family, because we spent more time together, we did more things without being, you know, overwhelmed with the news and social media and those types of things. Well, and we're in, I know a lot of people have practiced social distancing before uh, last week, before the Evers, his executive order. And their businesses had, uh, a lot of them had adjusted and adapted, or they had uh, plans in place already. But it's really just been like a week, or a little over a week, right, that we've been right. kind of in. The, and, and again, this doesn't seem to be uh, going to be lifted in a week from now. What concerns do you have 
um, with individuals or um, parents or, or whatever, I guess, just, just people in general, in, in a month from now, if we're still in this or a version of this? Well, I, you know, I said earlier that, you know, the, the economic pieces are, are no doubt big concerns. OK, you know what this means long term from our economy standpoint is it going to be a huge worry for people. We can ride things out in the short term. Long term, I don't know what that's going to mean. Yeah. You know, a month from now, I'm thinking of opening fishing. You know, I'm thinking of all the, the, the tourists and travelers that come to our area, the vacation land. We're heading into, you know, our peak time around here. W what does all that mean? I think, you know, some of those questions have yet to be yet to be answered. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to project what things are going to look like in a month, because right now, as you said, we're really only into this thing for weeks. Yeah, so it was like right now, everything that you're saying, the advice and the tips that, uh, for, for people at home uh, after just like a week. If you came back on in a month from now and we were still in this, what conversation do you think we'd be having then? Is it, uh, nope, pretty much everything was the same from the last time I was on, so just like rerun that episode because that's fine. Or do you think it's going to get more challenging each day and each week that it goes on? The longer it goes on, the more challenging it's going to be um, because we're not able to influence things we can't control. Okay, there's so much that's going on around us that we can't control. So the question becomes, whether it's one week into this or four weeks into this, what are the things that you can exercise some control or influence? Okay, yeah. I can influence what takes place within my home. I can exercise influence on how I take care of myself, my self-care, you know, my spirituality, uh, my relationships, my hobbies. Um, am I being intentional in those areas? So, yeah, to answer your question, I would be answering much of these things the same way, you know, four weeks from now as I am today, uh, because these are the things that enable us to offload and also to be able to fill up. So, Well, it's interesting you brought up control, because I don't know if you have uh, uh, know who my father is, but <clears throat> that that's kind of, uh, you know, control of my father, just, you know. Uh, this needs to, the, the lift, the stay-at-home order is going to have to get lifted sooner rather than later because dad's running out of rooms to paint and redo and recarpet at the house they only have so many rooms but i mean he has just gone on a tear because he just okay. can't make it and, and i just thought he needed to be busy or something which he always does but that's just interesting they brought that up because i know that's one area that i've struggled with was the the i didn't know what that was the word that i was looking for was the control part of it and it's mm -hmm. just knowing that i can't go somewhere that drives me crazy even though yep. you know a week or two weeks ago i wasn't going to go anywhere today anyway but now that i'm told i can't that I don't know. I don't, I don't like that feeling. Yep. Interesting. What yeah, else? Yeah, that's, that's the unsettling piece. Now, for, for, to your dad, to your point about your dad, as a crow files, I'm not too far from him, so he can paint any <laughs> of my bedrooms that he <laughs> wants to. When he runs out, I'll I, tell him to call Yeah, you. <laughs> absolutely. So I'll even, yeah. So yeah. we can maintain social distancing because you can probably walk. It's not that far. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. There you go. Awesome. What else? Anything else you want to talk about? Anything, uh, anything we didn't cover that you want to cover? You know, just be aware of how you're treating each other during this time. You know, um, th that to me is going to be one of the biggest uh, uh, things that we remember is how we responded as people during a really stressful time. Um, so kindness is free. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the bottom line. So. All righty. Well, thank you, Darren. And yeah, actually, if, if uh, you'd like, and if we're still kind of in this in a few weeks from now, we're probably going to run out of guests at some point. So we may have to start uh, repurposing some. So uh, uh, if you're interested, we'd love to have you back on and talk, man. Are you telling me I'm going to be recycled? Um, no. <laughs> repurposed. <laughs> repurposed. Repurposed. Okay. <laughs> that's, okay. that's the yeah, buzzword yeah. that we like to use around here. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Dave. All right, cool. Special thank you to today's guest, Darren Cox, and thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 8.30 as we'll be joined by Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald. Stay safe, keep your social distance, and have a blessed day.